All right. Well, here is our outline for today. Um, I know some of you are uh, people who know SIGMA, the Sustainable Groundwater Management Act, backwards and forwards, and then some of you may be new to it. So I have five slides from some colleagues at the Department of Water Resources that give an overview. And then we'll discuss uh, some conditions in Madera County, why, why we might want to focus here as one of the, the places that seems like ground zero for Sigma. We'll talk through our allocations and then um, options for measurement. And then I would be glad to take your questions. So beginning with the Sustainable Groundwater Management Act. These are some slides from DWR. As you probably have learned, for over 100 years, service water has been managed. In fact, starting in 1914, that's why when people talk about water rights, they'll talk about pre-1914 water rights. But groundwater is really quite different, and it was only managed voluntarily at a local level. Um, for example, uh, agencies had to develop something called AB 3030 plan which discussed how they were going to manage groundwater. But it was voluntary. It didn't have sustainability necessarily as a goal. So during the last drought, um, 2012, 2013, there was an extreme focus on the groundwater conditions that we, that we have in droughts, where you have people's wells going dry, families in crisis having to buy bottled water, run hoses from neighbors to their own land so that they have water. There was also a lot of subsidence and damage to infrastructure, particularly canals. So those factors um, led to the legislator enacting what we call SIGMA, the Sustainable Groundwater Management Act. And that was in late 2014. So it was a long time coming. So then we get into this process where we form groundwater sustainability agencies and all around California in the basins where Sigma applied, groundwater sustainability agencies formed in 2015 and 2016. Now there was this pathway to, um, to deal with groundwater through an alternative plan. So if you were somewhere that it already did good groundwater management, you could submit an alternative option. You did not have to follow everything in the, in the Sustainable Groundwater Management Act. But most of us in the Central Valley uh, formed groundwater sustainability agencies. And then if we were in a critically overdrafted Subbasin, we had to write a plan, a GSP, Groundwater Sustainability Plan, and submit it in January of 2020 to the State Department of Water Resources. And then the plans were reviewed. It took a long time for them to be reviewed, um, approximately two years. And then we all received feedback. Most of the plans in the Central Valley were, were deemed incomplete, which meant you had six months to revise and resubmit. Um, and then at least in Madera County, all of the plans were deemed inadequate, at which point you um, start to pull your hair out. So the, the law says that every five years, you need to resubmit a plan. And then the time from 2020 to 2040 is when you should be doing projects and management actions to lead to sustainability. So kind of in short, as soon as the law passed, people started forming groundwater sustainability agencies, critically overdrafted subbasins submitted a plan by January of 2020. And then every five years, you're supposed to submit or revise your plan as you're putting projects and management actions into effect. So where exactly? Does the Sustainable Groundwater Management Act apply? There are a lot of groundwater basins in California, but it applies especially in the high and medium basins and then the critically overdrafted basins. And that's where I work. You can see these are all the striped ones. So 
we talked about this period of time from 2020 to 2040 where you have to become sustainable. Well, really, what does that mean? The central tenet of Sigma is that you are eliminating groundwater overdraft, meaning you're not pumping more than naturally comes into the system or that is imported into the system. And while you're eliminating groundwater overdraft, you also are trying to avoid the undesirable results. People refer to these as the six uh, deadly sins of Sigma. So they are the lowering of groundwater levels, the reduction of storage. And of course, these two are, are uh, peas in a pod. They happen you know, at the same time. Degraded water quality, uh, subsidence, meaning you're pumping in ways that are sinking the land, uh, depletion of interconnected streams, and then seawater intrusion is, of course, an issue on the coast, not as much in the valley. So it, what you're doing is pretty challenging work because you have to develop a plan that does all of these by 2040 but um, also takes into account all beneficial uses and users. So you're, you're thinking about domestic wells and residential use, you're thinking about farming, you're thinking about people in cities and rural residents, you're thinking about new developments and old developments. It, it's, a, it's a complicated thing to develop a plan where everybody's happy and probably most likely everybody's a little um, unhappy in the end maybe a lot unhappy. So that is the background on the Sustainable Management Act. We're gonna shift now to talking about Madera County. So we talked about how at the end of 2014, the Sustainable Groundwater Management Act became a law and people started forming agencies, these groundwater sustainability agencies. So this is the valley floor portion of Madera County, and we're right in the heart of California. And you can see that there's quite a few agencies here. So, so there are three sub-basins. Um, this part up here is the Chachala Sub-Basin and it's Chachala Water District, Triangle T Water District, and um, it goes into Merced County a little bit. And there's a mutual water company that's in Merced, uh, as well as Madera. And then in the Madera subbasin, there's Madera Irrigation District. The city itself, which is in Madera Irrigation District, became its own GSA. So did Madera Water District, which is in Madera Irrigation District. There's Root Creek, uh, Gravelly Ford. and I think really the takeaway here is there are a lot of agencies that formed. Some of them were existing um, water districts. Some of them were sort of sleeping or dormant and came back to life with Sigma. And the way the law worked is counties, like where I work, became responsible for everything that no one else wanted. So all of the area that was in between these other GSAs. So you can see that on the map is just white. And this is often people will refer to it as the white area. People like to blame the white area growers, but it's really everything that's not in a district. So this is kind of extreme balkanism, right? There's a crisis and rather than joining together and sharing resources, people throw up a lot of walls and just form their own little agency to deal with what they perceive is, is a smaller version of the problem. So just to give you an idea what is in um, the groundwater plans, we, we because we're in three sub-basins, Madera County is part of three completely separate groundwater sustainability plans, but I'll, I'll give you an overview of the Madera sub-basin joint GSP, that joint groundwater sustainability plan. So this is a hydrograph and it's showing this long time period from 1980 to 2090. The, the dots that are shown in blue are actual uh, data from well reads. So you can see there's this declining pattern. This is what happens and is happening throughout the Central Valley. Water levels are declining. And then this is projected into the future. This is what would happen if we did not do anything. 
if we did not have a plan and projects and management actions, we have uh, declining groundwater levels and a lot of depletion of storage. So here's what that looks like in a bar graph. So if you did not do anything in the Madera subbasin, you have about 545,000 acre feet being extracted. You have a fair amount of natural recharge. This is from rainfall as well as seepage from canals. All of our canals are unlined. So that all is coming back in. It's 379,000 approximately. This is again, if we did nothing looking into the future. And so of course there's a gap. There's a lot more extracted than comes in. So what we did and probably what most water managers would do is we looked at how we could be very aggressive about recharge projects. And we, we could bring in on average about 60,000 acre feet of new water. There is uh, an east side Chachilla bypass um, to the San Joaquin River that is running right now. It is full of water and there is great potential to save some of that water before it heads out to sea and get it in the ground. And there are folks right now doing recharge. So it's, it's 60,000 acre feet on average, that doesn't mean it's 60,000 acre feet every year. It's more like every three years, you would have to take this really big gulp of water of 180,000 acre feet. However, even with all of this extra water coming in, you can see there's still a gap between the amount extracted and the amount of water coming in. So that's where demand reduction comes in. And so demand reduction means people taking out acres of crops, um, idling the land or planting something that uses a lot less water. So we as, um, as a county responsible for all those areas that were white on the map developed an allocation. So with all of our projects and management actions, you can see Here's what projected groundwater levels would look like in the future. And it's important not to get too hung up on this because really these highs and lows here depend on what future hydrology you assume. We don't really know what that will look like, but you can see massive improvement. You no longer see groundwater levels trending downward. They stabilize with projects and management actions in the groundwater sustainability plan. So let's shift then from the groundwater sustainability plan to allocations. So allocation is a word used in lots of different ways, but in this case, what we mean is a water budget. It has two parts to it, sustainable yield, what used to be called safe yield. That's the water that's here more or less naturally and then transition water. And this is a category of water that decreases over, over time. It is continued overdraft. So our allocations are measured in inches of water per acre um, as ET of applied water, evapotranspiration of applied water. Um, the water, the allocation decreases over time. We also created a way to share the allocation between acres. So if you own or manage land, you can manage an allocation for all of those acres and that's your farm unit. So that allows for some flexibility. So people can take out acres where, where their trees are less productive or where they're at the end of their life and then keep those acres out and share and access the water underneath for the acres that are still in production. So those are kind of the basics of our allocation. It's two water types. One of them decreases over time, and we're measuring it as um, evapotranspiration of applied water. So the allocation itself was developed by an advisory committee during um, the Sustainable Groundwater Management uh, Agency formation. Lots and lots and lots of advisory committees popped up uh, to, to give ideas and to sort of vet um, 
some of the work of engineers and scientists. So our advisory committee had a combination of people who lived here, people who farmed here, people who cares a lot about water, and they developed the allocation. Now it was very, very painful because there's a sense that maybe Sigma will go away. Um, a lot of people from what I heard would participate in our meetings and then go out um, to the parking garage and, and that their trucks say things like, this will never happen. This will just never happen, but it is happening. So these guys looked at a couple of different types of allocations. Um, one is by crop type. So if you're, if you're doing an allocation by crop type, you're going to allocate more for the water needs of almonds as opposed to grapes. Um, that has some fairness issues, right? And it's kind of giving more water if you're using more water, which it doesn't seem like it's a great idea. You can also do allocations by historical use. Um, and of course, Although there are averages for what crops use, there, there's all sorts of different water use. And if anyone um, uses Open ET um, and looks at data there, you can see all sorts of ranges just for almonds or for grapes, for example. The biggest range seems to be grapes. And where the advisory committee settled was on doing an allocation that was equal for all of the irrigators. So this is just an allocation for irrigated ag. It's only within the county white area. That's where we have jurisdiction. And one of the key things for the advisory committee was that it would basically work as a step function, which probably we all remember from algebra, but just in case you don't, it's, it's where there's one slope for a certain amount of time and then a different slope. So this had a gentle slope for the first five years, which is where we are now, and then a steeper slope for later. Um, the thinking there was that it would take a little time to get adjusted to sigma. Um, it may have also been a stall tactic. So we had the advisory committee adopt an allocation as an approach and some key principles. Then it went to the board and the board of supervisors in Madera is the board of directors for the GSA. Um, and they eventually adopted an allocation. Um, it, it did win an award from the Association of Counties, which I think acknowledges that this was some, it was a very heavy lift to do. Um, so we're proud of that. So um, here is a table with too many numbers, but I did wanna show you some of the components of the allocation. So. There's sustainable yield, the water that is here naturally, that is not changing. So that's the same amount each year. It doesn't decrease over time. Then there is this transition water amount, and this does decrease over time. And this is very gently because it's, a, it's that gentle slope. It does after 2025 decrease at a much steeper rate. So um, if you sum up the sustainable yield and the transition water, you get the water use in 2020. So we started out at about where we were, and then we've had a gentle slope, and then we're headed towards the steeper slope. So it ends up being about 28, 27 inches ETAW. So definitely less than people are probably applying if they're growing almonds. Um, and it might be more than what you're applying if you're growing grapes. So the allocation and choosing the allocation immediately led us to a measurement problem. And we, we knew it was there, but... Um, it just grows. So the first issue is why don't you just meter everything? Well, the county GSA, much of it isn't metered right now. Um, you weren't required to put in a meter when you drilled a well before 2017. Um, we do require that new wells are metered, but there are also a lot of illegally drilled wells and really not bandwidth to investigate that. Um, the growers tend to be larger in Madera. 
they tend to also like a grower, a farmer might also be a well driller. So he might have a, a rig for drilling a well. So there's, there's this idea that if we really just rely on the, the applied water data from a meter that we're not going to capture all of the water use. It might in fact incentivize drilling illegal wells because they know that we're, um, we're using data from the wells that we know about. So then we thought, well, we could, we could maybe use open ET, which is of course um, a development of a free resource, but it really wasn't at the point where it could be available. At, at a way that we could track for allocations. And if you haven't been on open ET data, um, really a lot of fun and you can look at water use all around the valley. So we issued an RFP, um, a request for a proposal for services for someone to develop a product or, or describe a product in a way that we could purchase it. And um, we had a grower panel and they ended up selecting something called Arrowwatch, which is uh, the brand name of, of the product that uses CBAL, the surface energy balance algorithm uh, for land from Wim Bastionson in the Netherlands. So the measurement problem came with a lot of training because we were now using satellites and it was different. It turned out that many people did not really have a handle on how much water they had been using. They were either not metered um, or they were metered in a in a funky way where they were they maybe didn't replace the meter or calibrate it on a regular basis. So we had a ton of training starting in, in 2020. You can see this. We started teaching people about the sea ball and the surface energy balance algorithm for land and really what a root zone water budget was. We did a presentation to our grower group, the Madera Ag Water Association. So one in November of, and December of 2020. Then in 2021, we walked people how to set up their watch account. Um, we talked them through how the allocations look. We made YouTube videos. We, we, it seemed like we were talking about watch a lot. Here is a, an example of the sort of imagery that is available on Watch. So you can see it's showing the ET of applied water. It's a cumulative measurement. We run um, measurements on the calendar year, which was preferred by growers. So this is a measurement through, um, so May 23rd, as of a couple of days ago. This looks very, very dry. Someone might not be irrigating this at all. You can also see kind of some interesting patterns where there are wetter areas. So maybe a, like a water course or a natural drainage that runs through. Um, growers really like these maps and they liked that the maps were almost live. They do, maybe did, they, they tended to confuse what they were seeing through the satellite image and the process data with what I would think of as meter telemetry, meaning they were they often would confuse the ET of applied water with applied water. And so that's kind of a growing edge for them. Here are some funny things people have said. So um, misconceptions. So one is Google can't find my house, so how can it measure my water? We're not, of course, using Google, but that is where one often sees Google Maps. Um, how does EraWatch know the difference between my neighbor's field and mine? They're both green, and that gets really to the heart of how Seaball works. We're not really just looking at green. Um, we have a lot of these where I start watering on a certain date, but I'm seeing this ET signature before. And of course, um, plants use stored water, right? You might, you might have a plant that starts transpiring in February, but maybe you're not going to turn on your irrigation system to March. And then there was a lot of plans where people were going to cover their trees with tarps or clay dust so that the satellite measurements wouldn't 
be able to calculate the ET. So there's always someone trying to trick. Um, so that kind of lends us, what leads us to where we are today. And I'm, I'm almost done, but what we offer today is basically three different options. So one of them is ZeroWatch, which is using satellite measurement to measure ET and then calculate ETAW. And growers have access to reports really anytime they can access the portal. And of course, if they like the internet and they have a desk and they have a computer where they do their paperwork, this is probably a pretty good method. We do allow them to appeal data if they have meter data and with monthly reads and it's been the meter's been inspected to be installed correctly and it's been calibrated. We added by grower request land IQ, which you've probably heard of. That's used in the South Valley quite a lot. It is another system, a different algorithm, and it couples measurements with local um, like weather stations. So you get really a little bit more data on rainfall. Um, land IQ gives us a spreadsheet, and then we have to create a paper report so everything goes to the grower in a very not live sort of way. They're getting it like two months afterwards. So this is where we are right now. We're trying to generate these reports. And um, Land IQ is measuring ETs. So then we have to uh, calculate ETAW. Um, we did have a lot of requests for people to use many methods and then just choose the one that had the lowest number. Because of course, if it's the lowest number, then it's most accurate. That's a joke. It's really not true. Um, so we're really having them choose only one method. Um, and we do have an appeals process with Land IQ as well. Same thing as with EraWatch. And we've also added a meter option, but it has requirements. They have to have a pre inspection for the installation, the meter needs to be calibrated, and they need to take monthly photos between the first and the 10th of the month. So we had 45 people out of 380 that chose meters, but each month we have fewer and fewer because taking monthly photos is a lot. It's a lot. So in the end, we have these, these three measurement options, private meters where, um, there's no map option for them. You know, they're, they're only getting the data. Um, they, can, they can process it on their own, but we're not really generating a report until the end of the year. Land IQ, in which case they get a delay in the data or EraWatch where it's more or less live, but some people are not a fan. So this concludes my presentation and the journey from Sigma to GSA formation to demand management and allocations and measurement. And if there's time, I'd be glad to answer questions. Thank you so much, uh, Stephanie. Any questions on Zoom or here in the classroom? Charlie? Uh, Stephanie, I read somewhere where the Madera County GSA suspended the reduction in ET of refined water for like two years, I believe. And if so, does that mean later on the, like you mentioned, the slope will have to be even steeper, like moving forward? Well, there's a lot of rumors about Madera, so I don't know that one. But um, we have kept the allocation that the board adopted. So it, it really is just like a small reduction for the first five years and then a steeper reduction. So you're right though, the, the board, if they did suspend anything, they would have to catch up later. Uh, Michael? Hi, Stephanie. Uh, thank you for this wonderful presentation. Um, I'm a current master's student uh, under Rosemary, and I study uncertainty in ET satellite measurements. So this is just right up my alley. This is super gnarly, super cool. Uh, does Madero County consider, or does EraWatch provide 
uh, any sense of uncertainty measurements uh, in what they're providing to you through their satellite measurements. Uh, for instance, uh, I study with OpenET and their models, and I noticed that CBOL tends to come in as the highest estimate, uh, and those ranges can be quite wide on OpenET, at least. Uh, do you have a sense of certainty? Yeah, I, I mean, I think it's similar to meters in the field anyway, that it's in the five to 10. Um, the, the version of CBOL that we use is kind of a, maybe a little bit more evolved than the one in OpenET. That's um, that's an older version of CBOL. So I've been told our version is much better, but but I would say five to 10%. And if anybody knows about meters in the field and accuracy and has studies on that, you know, most of the studies we could find were on meters that were in the lab. And of course, they're all highly accurate in the lab, but we have seen some of the weirdest meter installations uh, ever. We've also seen folks who just have propeller meters that they've never replaced, right? So the moving parts slow over time and you, you end up thinking you're extremely efficient. Gotcha. Uh, thank you so much. Thank you. Rosemary, I think you, you are. Great. So super interesting, Stephanie. Thank you for this. So are you working in any areas where you're comparing the ET predictions that you're getting from AeroWatch and Land IQ, so that you have this direct one-to-one -one comparison. We, yeah, we are. We actually have a contract with um, David's Engineering to do some work with that and with meters for this coming year, because it seems like it's a really a good opportunity and a nice data set to do some of that work. Um, I, and I should say we didn't really talk about grower feelings, but growers are not loving the satellite measurement. So the more we can do to build trust and to share data, the, the better. So that's why we're spending money in that area. Well, what we ran into is some um, groups that are providing ET estimates would actually not let us use the data in a publication that was going to show the comparison. And I don't know if there's any way of everyone collectively saying, wait a minute, this is not how science works. There has to be open data. We have to be able to do reproducible science. We have to be able to, you're nodding, you agree. Yeah, I think the more we can get that message out there that we need to be allowed to verify these measurements. Well, because I mean, the other piece, as I mentioned, is growers think the lowest number has to be the most accurate, which mm, yeah, no. Masa, you want to go up next? Yeah, that'd be great. Um, okay. Thank you so much. Oh, sorry. Um, thank you so much for that presentation. Um, I have a question more on like towards the beginning of your presentation about recharge projects. Um, I know you were talking about how you're trying to pull 90,000 acre feet um, of water from the Chochilla um, sub basin. I was wondering where specifically do you think most of these recharge projects are going to happen? Or like, are there any specific regions in the Madeira subbasin specifically that you want to recharge? Uh, so good question. So um, all of the 14 GSAs in Madeira County, all have recharge projects. So that that's really, um, it's exciting. The of course, what you need for recharge is to have a source of water. So the biggest source of water is the Eastside Chowchilla bypass. And so there are folks already who are adjacent to the bypass who are taking water both on the east and western side. But the, the problem is there really isn't any infrastructure for getting that water further to the east. So that's really where, where we need to spend money. And that's where we did a rate study to to try and build the distribution system to get a lot of water into the ground. Other opportunities for, um, for water include um, 
there's uh, section 215 water from the Bureau of Reclamation is their flood flows and there's the ability to use existing infrastructure to move that around. So there, there really is the potential for a lot of recharge to happen. But before the governor's executive order, there were a lot of different hurdles with that. That's really been very helpful to us. Got it. Thank you so much. Yeah, hi. Um, I just have a question kind of more about the general um, policy standpoint of Sigma and, and how it differs from county to county. Um, like what specifically is the role of public input from one county to another and how like much does that vary? How much does the farmer in Madera County have, you know, maybe more influence than a farmer in, um, you know, Butte County or somewhere else? Oh, that's that's a good question. Um, so our role as a county is super weird. That's why I tried to show that map of the white area. Most places, all of that land was annexed into other districts. Um, so like, I think we're the only county responsible for that amount of acres. It's around 220,000. So it's really quite a big district, but there is a wide range of input opportunities. So counties are probably the best because we have regular meetings. They um, they all stream on YouTube. So people from your past can find terrible photos of you. Um, you know, we, we have public input at every meeting. We have workshops. We actually found during COVID, we got like a lot more participants by having webinars, which you might think farmers aren't down with that, but they they seemed pretty um, pretty willing to do that. So you know that's kind of one extreme is lots of workshops and public meetings, and then there's also districts that honestly don't meet very often. And so if you wanted to give input, you would have to be super deliberate and track down the meeting and show up at that one time. So really a wide, wide range of, of um, availability for input. Yeah, thank you. Hmm. I have one more. Uh, so I know last year in December, uh, so Madera Superior Court issued a preliminary injunction against like, the GST fees. So how, how, are you, how are you guys dealing with that situation without being and unable to collect? to collect money. Yeah. So um so that could be the subject of a whole other little chat, but basically public agencies can't assess fees without going through what's called a prop 218 and there's lots of different flavors, but basically you ask people to vote. So the board of supervisors for the most part can't do any fees without putting it out to vote. And we did what's called a protest, which is you, you have the ability to mail in a protest form. Um, so we had three different rate studies. They all had a public hearing and one group um, protested. The, that group then, um, and they were successful in one sub-basin. So there's no money for projects there. Then they sued in the two sub-basins they weren't successful in. So um, at this point, we can't collect any money to do recharge or land repurposing or help people whose wells go dry. Um, and it is, it is very frustrating, but um, there really is no other path forward for a public agency. You have to go through Prop 218 in order to get funds. And so you, you may, and, and this is happening, we're not the only folks in it. It seems like Really what people are protesting is Sigma. There are some farmers who don't, um, who, who think that this is not needed. And so they're voting anything that moves things ahead down. Probably more than you wanted to know. Thank you so much. Well, thank you for inviting me and nice to see all of you.
<laughs> Thanks. Okay, thank you to all those in Zoom.